Hey. All right. So uh, <laughs> my name is Joshua Watt, um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about what's new in the SPDX3 work that we've been working on in uh, Open Data <coughs> in Yocto. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I work for Garmin, primarily making electronics for boats. Um, and I've been working there since 2009. And uh, we've been using Open Embedded in the Yocto project um, to build our electronics since about 2016. And I'm a member of the uh, Technical Steering Committee. I mostly get blamed for hash equivalents and SPDX these days. Um, and uh, there's all my emails and IRCs and whatever other things you have to have these days. Uh, how many of you know what an SBOM is? Okay, that's great. Most of you do. Um, so basically the point of an SBOM is to describe what's in the software that you're shipping to your customers or using or distributing internally or whatever you need to know. Um, so kind of the idea that you have uh, with an SBOM is that you have these components um, that are in your final software application and you can describe the relationships that are between them. You can say what you know about these applications or these components and what you don't know about them, um, which is also important. Um, and there's a pretty good link here to an NTIA document that kind of describes that uh, in more detail. Um, you know, and the reason this is important is because it's actually very important to know where your software is coming from. Um, so you want to know, like, oh, you know, where, who provided this software to me, or who provided this component of my software to me, like, what version is it? Um, it's also important to know if you're complying with all the software licenses. It's, it's important to know if it's either intentionally or unintentionally been tampered with uh, before or after you acquired it. Um, and you want to know uh, if it's vulnerable to any exploits. And really the question you're trying to answer is, given some final thing that I have, can I trace that back to the source code that generated it? That's, if you can do that, you've got a, you've got a pretty good SBOM. A lot of times these are described as like uh, nutrition information for software. That's pretty popular. This is pretty popular. You know, and the, the idea here is that uh, it's, you know, people widely recognize uh, this nutrition label, right? Like, you look at that and you can understand that pretty easily. It's kind of a common way of talking about what's in your food, right? Because people, uh, well, some people like to know what's actually in their food. Some don't. You know, that's fine. But it's still there for them. Um, and so uh, SBOM is kind of um, the same idea, right? It's a common way of talking about what's in your software, right? Um, so... Uh, we do that, and so this, the, uh, it encodes your software supply chain in a way that people can understand. Because you might not be able to tell that just from looking at the binary, right? Just like, you know, you cook something or buy something, don't know just by looking at it necessarily what's in it. Yeah, and I, I do like the analogy of the uh, nutrition label. It, it is missing this, like, supply chain part of it, um, which is also part of SBOMS. Um, so that's the ability to like trace things back to where they came from. Okay, so uh, when we're talking about S bombs in uh, Yocto project and Open Embedded, um, I think we all kind of know how this process works. For uh, building images, we have our source code, we've got our metadata, and we've got some policy information, and you know we check that all into this uh, tool called Bitbake, and it spits out this magical thing we call a target image. And we put that on our widget and profit, right? That's great. That's uh, the part we like, right? Um, oh, and uh, just so you know, this is a uh, very expanded talk of a 15-minute talk I gave at the SP at the SBOM room uh, yesterday. Uh, so, all right. Now, when we talk about target images, we're of course talking about a bunch of different things. Um, it's not just the images you would flash in a Raspberry Pi. It could be SDKs or build tools or you know your package feeds or containers or QMU or firmware for microcontroller. Um, and this is kind of a very simplified build flow, uh, sort of getting into how we actually generate the uh, SBOM data in SPDX format. So it's a very simplified build flow. Um, so we have here, we've got our, this is our, um, our native tools that we build. 
you know, importantly and somewhat uniquely uh, for Open Embedded, we actually build the cross compiler and most of the native tools that you're going to use later on in your build. Um, and so because of that, uh, we actually have a very strong built-in software supply chain, right? So we're building a lot of the tools we're using to build your actual target packages that then go into your target image, right? So internally, we can already trace this target image back to the GCC we use to cross-compile it, right? So you start with your minimal set of host tools, uh, and we've got uniquely um, a very strong software supply chain just because we're already doing a lot of that stuff. So the strategy for um, doing SBOMs that we currently have uh, is that uh, when we're doing these steps in the build, uh, we spit out an SPDX document that describes basically just what we did. And that's really all an SBOM is, is like, what did you do at different steps during your build? What sort of files are you processing? Like, what's in there, right? So as we go along and build all of these things, we generate these SPDX documents. Um, and then we generate one for the target image at the end, and then we combine it all together, and we get this SPDX deliverable that goes with the target image, and you, we're all good to go, right? Like, it's perfect. Got your got got your S bomb, and uh, you know you can. So Joshua, does the S bomb include the native tools that were on the build machine? No, it does not. So yeah, so that's the part that's missing here. Um, and I do have I have a ton of talks about this. I I've, I've talked about this, I don't know how many times now. Um, so it does not include like your, it, it can, okay. right? So it doesn't include your host tools. Um, um, so like your, like, it, you know, you start with Ubuntu and you've got GCC on there. You need that in order to build these um, and a couple of other uh, packages and things. Um, and those aren't going to be in the SBOM. However, if you're really interested in like deep supply chains and really want to go back into the host tools, like you want to be able to trace this back to some golden build image, um, we do actually have a thing um, that is the build tools and you can generate an SBOM for this and then use the build tools as your host tools and you will be able to trace your SPD, your uh, SBOM from your target image back through all your target recipes to your native tools, to your build tools SPDX. It doesn't today make that link for you, but it is, you know, it's, it exists. Um, and then you would be able to trace that back to pretty deeply in your supply chain because again, the build tools are built exactly the same way, right? So uh, one of the things you could do if you're really worried about uh, uh, tracing that back to some like golden machine is you could you could have your golden machine that's like completely isolated build your build tools on that distribute your build tools you could trace all your builds back there so yes in a way yeah just to address traceability there are a few projects that try to bootstrap the host tools from scratch so if you look on the internet, you can find yeah. reproducible minimal images, yep. which are just enough to start this process. Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah, so you could do that too. Um, that would also work. Um, so there, there are ways of doing it. Um, it's not like intrinsically, intrinsically there. But <coughs> sorry, I've been talking a lot this week. Um, this is what our current SPDX2 model uh, looks like for um, what we generate and put in the SBOM. Um, so basically, uh, these are going to be the different uh, uh, SPDX packages. SPDX2 really only has a concept of a package, and so anything that looks like this is going to be a package that we, uh, SPDX package. Um, so we have one that describes the, SPD, the, the recipe, um, which I'll, I'll explain why that's a little bit weird in a minute. But we've got a, a, a SPDX that describes the recipe. Um, I'm just really kind of describing the build itself. We've got another one that describes the packages, like the IPKs that get generated from that recipe. Um, and then we can link all these together. So the, the recipes can uh, have build time dependencies on other recipes. Um, the packages uh, that we generated have the generated from relationship to the recipe that built them. Um, we can also do some really interesting stuff with like the debug, uh, the, the source code listed in the debug data. So we can actually 
uh, link the package SPDX or the, the, the package, the IPK package back to another recipe because of the debug data. Um, and that's really useful for like static libraries. Uh, generally, static libraries can be a huge pain to track with SBOMs um, because there's not necessarily a good link that says like the static library just came in, right? It's not like dynamic libraries where you, there's a header file or a header in the ELF file that lists all the dynamic libraries it needs. Static libraries are just there. So using that uh, debug source can help us trace that back for you. Um, and then like the packages obviously contain files. Um, and then we have to do this weird thing up here because uh, of uh, runtime data, which I'll explain a little bit also. Um, we can also optionally add all the source code that got downloaded um, into that recipe as PDX. Um, it's off by default because it's massive. <laughs> it uh, increases the size of your SBOMs by like an order of magnitude. <laughs> so it's off by default. Um, and we have an SPDX document that describes the image, and there's all sorts of other relationships going on here. So it's, it's pretty comprehensive. We can describe a lot of stuff with SPDX too. And uh, basically, anything that we can build, uh, we can generate pretty meaningful uh, SBOM SPDX output for. So all of your standard C, C++, you know, make, auto tools, and, uh, you know, whatever your build system is, most of that stuff just works, no problems. Um, the host build tools, as I mentioned, since we're building them ourselves, we're <coughs> actually able to describe all the uh, SBOM information for that. The Linux kernel, that's a huge one. Um, it's, well, when I was first giving these presentations, we were one of the only projects that could generate meaningful SPDX for the Linux kernel, um, just because we were building it. That's probably changed since. Um, you know, those target images that we produce, the SDKs, container images, that's another one that when I was first giving these presentations, a lot of the stuff to generate SBOMs for containers was all post scan heuristic data. You know, we can actually generate it from first principles builds, um, which is, is unique. I think a lot of this has gotten better over time, uh, like the images. And uh, Rust and Go and probably like NPM and those tools. Um, we can generate um, SPDX for them, but it's usually only the stuff we can directly see. So it's like the thing you're building we can generate good SPDX for in its source, but once that goes and fetches stuff from cargo or whatever, we're not currently in a place where we can give you meaningful uh, SBOM information about those dependencies it's pulling in. Mostly that's just because I don't know anything about Rust and Go, and so I have no idea how to actually get that information. So if you know anything about how to parse out the dependencies of Rust and Go. Rust Cargo has a SBOM generator. Oh, yeah. I think Cargo has an SBOM generator. Oh, that would be so perfect. probably what would be the best is to let that generate the yes. SBOM for the package with all its dependencies and then integrate that SBOM. Sounds like you should submit some patches. <laughs> Please. Like, I, I don't deal with Rust and Go, so I really just don't know that's why they're, that's so why they're for, under So for the Go, there is currently a patch set in the, uh, already in the master branch that um, the recipe tool can generate all the dependencies in the source URI. That means yeah. feedback will know all about them. Yeah, so they probably just need some extra tooling then, I think, might be the case. I don't know. We'd, we'd have to look. Um, no, actually, you just so you just provide um, the URL for your Go project, and the recipe tool would handle all that. There is still an issue that not all the licenses are known for for the recipe tool, and the all the checksums. So that's that needs to be also. Yeah, to be sorry. I meant we probably need a little extra tooling in the SPDX generation to know how to deal with that. Um, it sounds like yeah, we we know all the data, so or some of it. Cool. All right. Okay, so that was SPDX2. So there, there are, it, it's great, like you can generate these things. Um, and you can use them. Um, some of it is like highly specific to the way that we generate SPDX data. So one of the problems is that there aren't a lot of third party tools that you're going to be able to find that can just, you can just shove our data into um, for a couple reasons. And I'm going to, talk about some of those here and how we are solving these problems with SPDX3. Um, 
so the first one is this like recipe SPDX element that I was alluding to. Um, it's not like SPDX2 really only has the concept of a package, which is supposed to be like a thing that you are sending to someone, right? Like it's a unit of thing. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. Um, but really what we want to describe is that we did a build, like we did a process at a certain point in time, um, and it, that's just not what package in SPDX2 means. Um, so SPDX3, uh, they actually added the concept of a build element um, that does describe a process that you did at a certain point in time. Um, and I was on the uh, SPDX uh, group that worked on that. Um, and so we can actually use that now to describe that instead of that recipe element that we had before. Um, and kind of the way that this works is that you have your, you have your build element um, and you can describe sort of abstract dependencies between build elements just like you know, in BitBake, one task might come after another task or before another task. That's kind of what this depends on is trying to uh, model. Um, and then there are relationships that also describe, you know, the input files that the build uh, takes in and like output, uh, sorry, input files that it takes in and output files that it produces, right? Um, so you can track like this build pulled in these files, did some things with it, and then spit out these files. Um, and so that's really useful for tracing. Um, I know the arrows look a little weird. Uh, it's because of the way SPDX3 relationships work. It's just kind of what it is. And of course, you can also track um, uh, dependencies through those file relationships, right? So this, this build outputs this file, and this build basically pulls it in as an input. So that's another way to track dependencies through the system. Um, in addition to that, uh, it also supports uh, nested builds. So you can say, like, there was an overarching build, and there were these, basically, sub-builds that happened as a result of that overarching build. So in our case, this is, like, you could have a build element for the top level invocation of BitBake that the user typed in on the command line. And then each uh, SPDX, like each recipe that got built will get its own sub build element underneath that. Um, that uses this ancestor of relationship. <coughs> yeah, so you can do that. Um, this is actually really cool when you pair it with S state because what this will let us do is you do a build one day, and that's one top-level BitBake invocation. And then that res uh, that's got these recipe builds under it, and then those get stored in S state. And you do a build on the next day, and that restores from S state. In your final image, you'll actually see both top-level BitBake builds that produced those objects. So that really will let you track very finely grained where your S state came from. Because um, you can track it back to the top level bit big build in your S bomb that generated it, even if it's pulled from S state. Um, so that's very powerful for our specific use case of using S state. In addition to that, uh, the build uh, elements have a bunch of other relationships that are very useful for tracking them. So there's this has host relationship. Um, so that's basically the host where the build was run. So if you have a complete SPDX document that describes the VM or the machine that you're building your host on, you can link your build elements to that, to that host, and then you'll know basically all the information about where you built that build on. Um, in addition, there are two uh, relationships called invoked by and delegated to, um, and that's basically describing who did the actual build, who or what did the actual build, and who or what wanted that build done. So kind of the difference is the invoked by is the actual user or agent that is doing the actual build. So that could be like GitHub, right? GitHub might be the agent that is actually performing the build. Delegated to is a relationship that says, like, I'm the user that clicked the button that caused GitHub to do the build. So you can kind of distinguish between those two use cases if you want to. So if you're sitting down and like doing it on your actual computer, you would be invoked by. If you're clicking the button to cause the CI to do it, the CI would be the invoked by and you'd be the delegating user.
Does that make sense? So it lets you track very finely those types of things. I think there's other relationships that you can say, like, that you can attach to those agents and stuff. I haven't looked into that too much to describe them more fully. Uh, one of the other problems we had with SPDX2 um, was related to the way that uh, the SPDX IDs work. So packages in SPDX have identifiers uh, that, that identify them. The problem is that they are only valid in the scope of a given like SPDX document. Um, and then in addition to that, documents can only be referenced by other documents if you include the checksum of the target document. So in order to reference an SPDX ID in another document, you had to say, this SPDX ID, or I'm referencing this document with this checksum, and then I'm using this SPDX ID from that document. And that's fine. I completely understand why they <laughs> designed it that way when they did SPDX2. Um, the problem is that, quite on purpose, um, if you ever go back and change the target document, that changes its checksum and invalidates all of the references to it, right? So they, they did that on purpose for security reasons, and that's fine. Um, but that means that the documents are frozen in time. So once you've written an SPDX document, you basically can't change it because, again, it would invalidate all the links to it. Um, in, in broader usage, that's fine. But for us, we are generating SPDX documents as we go throughout the build. Um, and it, it's really difficult to not be able to go back and change documents and things like that when we are generating them as we go and trying to link them together and things like that. And that's why, if you were looking, there was that weird little runtime SPDX document. Um, and the reason we had to make a separate document to describe runtime dependencies is that while your build time dependencies have to be a directed acyclical graph, your runtime dependencies do not. It is perfectly fine to have circular runtime dependencies. All package managers allow this. It just means like if you have a loop, you have to pull in all those packages at once, right? Like that's just how they deal with it. Um, but because your runtime dependencies are not a directed acyclical graph, there is no way for you to transverse the graph of runtime dependencies and write out a document at each step that you never have to change. So the way we worked around it is we wrote all the packages in that, uh, uh, in that uh, package document. And then we would walk the runtime graph and make runtime documents. Um, but the runtime documents never referenced themselves, so it never became circular. They always referenced the package documents that had already been written. And they basically just said, hey, there's this other document that has a package that has runtime dependencies in this other package. It was kind of weird, a little bit annoying. Um, but we had to do it that way because of that reason, because you couldn't go back and change the documents very easily. And then the other problem that we had with that was it's, it's very, very difficult to merge SPDX2 documents because all of the identifiers are namespaced to a given document, which means they're not unique. So if you're trying to merge documents, you have to figure out if the ID that you're merging in conflicts with any of the IDs that you currently have. And if it does, you have to go find all the references to those IDs and change them. And it just gets very difficult very quickly. Um, which is why we just gave up, and the final SPDX2 output that you get um, when you do a build today is a tarball that just has all the SPDX documents in it, because I was like, ah, I can't merge these. <laughs> um, so yeah, we just gave up and put in a tarball. Um, one of the reasons it's hard to find external tools to parse our stuff. SPDX3 makes this much better. Um, it uses linked data, so like JSON-LD, if you're familiar with that. Um, and that's uh, better for a lot of reasons. So um, the first one is that objects can have a globally unique SPDX ID. Um, if you're familiar with JSON-LD, this would be the at ID property. I just call it SPDX ID. Um, and that's a, it's a IRI, which is a URL that doesn't have to go anywhere. It doesn't have to actually exist. It's just a way of namespacing things that looks like a URL. Um, and that can be referenced by anyone. You can just say, like, I'm referencing this thing that is an IRI, and you don't really have to specify where it is. You should, but you don't have to specify where it is. You can just say, this thing exists, I promise. <laughs> um, 
And this is basically mandatory. If your element can be referenced, you have to give it an IRI so that people can reference it um, out there. Um, and it's because they're globally unique, it's so much easier to merge documents because you don't have to worry about it. If you see the same IRI, it's the same thing, right? You can just assume that two equivalent IRIs are the same thing because they have to be globally unique if they are the same thing. Um, and this also makes it much easier for us to go through the build and generate these transitive documents as we're going um, because there's not really any restriction on being able to go back and like add something to a document. It doesn't invalidate uh, the, the, any references to any of the IRIs in that document, which is so much easier. Um, obviously, if you were publishing, there, there is a mechanism in SPDX3 where you can say, these IRIs are in this document, and this is its checksum, and you should definitely use that if you're publishing documents, but it's not mandatory. And so for the purposes of generating things as we're going through the build, we don't do that because we don't need to. Um, so what that means is the uh, end SPDX3 that we generate in Yocto or will generate in Yocto will be a single merged JSON-LD document. You'll just get one gigantic several hundred megabyte SPDX document um, that describes your target image. Yeah. So much better. Um, hopefully the tools have a much easier time handling that. Speaking of tools, <laughs> validation with SPDX2 was really hard because for some reason we just put everything in a tarball. Yeah, that was fun. Um, who did that? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, with SPDX2, we basically had to manually validate that we were doing it correctly, um, which was very difficult um, because none of the tools could, none of the tools take in a tarball of SPDX files, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Finally, we managed to find some of our documents that validate. That's and they, great. And they yes. are in the, in the p-test right now. Oh, good. good so good. if big things break, this test will break. But yeah. really the number of documents that actually validates is really small. Yeah. And, and, and originally, and again, like some of this is old and I haven't gone back and looked at it, but originally um, the validation tool didn't like the broken, like the broken references. It'd be like, you're referencing this thing that doesn't exist because the tool itself didn't understand external document references. So, you know, like, <laughs> it was just kind of like, well, I, I, so we couldn't even like use the tool to validate the little documents because it was like, where's this thing you're referencing? I was like, well, it's another document. I said it was. Here's the checksum. Um, so it didn't like that. Um, and the other thing was like a lot of the early tools or the early validation tool was web-based. You can't upload, you know, a hundred megabyte SPDX document to a web tool and expect it to like live. So <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully SPDX3 will be much better with this. Um, it actually is better already um, because one of the things that they did is um, it's, uh, there's a formal shackle model, which if, uh, who's, does anyone know about Shackle? No, it was new to me too. It's a, this whole wide world of, or uh, wild world of uh, formal models and things. So basically, like a Shackle model um, lets you, it's, I don't know the best way to describe it. It's, uh, so, um, have you, JSON schema, who knows what a JSON schema is? Yeah, okay. So Shackle is like, it's, it's kind of like a JSON schema, except instead of saying, like, you have these fields, you can say, like, this object must conform to this, like, constraints. It's, it, they call it, like, shapes. That's what the S is. It's like, it has to have this shape, which means it has to have these fields that are these things. Like, this must be a string, and this must be... So it's very similar to, uh, like, a schema, but more uh, generic. It's not just for JSON. Um, and so because it has this formal shackle model, um, there are tools where you can just take this shackle model and uh, validate it against a JSON LD document and I'll say, oh yeah, that matches the shape, you're fine, or spits out 100 warnings or whatever it is, right? Um, so even just having that shackle model means we can do offline validation much, much easier um, than we used to be able to do. Um, and it's all formalized, so there's tools that are not SPDX specific for that. Um, and then the, the bonus of this is that uh, we can actually automatically generate our 
Python language bindings for SPDX using that shackle model because it formally describes everything, right? It says there's these objects, they must have these fields and whatnot. So um, we're working with the SPDX team on this tool called shackle to code um, that they're going to use to just generate a bunch of language bindings for SPDX3, which will hopefully make it so much easier to write tools because you just do this and you can parse the documents and things like that. So. Uh, one of the other problems we had with SPDX2 was related to like CVEs and vulnerabilities. Um, so SPDX2, I think you could, I'm trying to remember, I think you could report a CPE. You could say like this is my CPE for a given thing, but there was no way of saying like this is the CPE and you're going to find all these CVEs, but we patched those already. That just didn't exist. Um, that wasn't an option in SPDX2. We we, Open Embedded, implemented a way to do it, um, but it's highly specific to our SPDX. So no tool out there that isn't like aware of the way we do it would just be able to tell you that that's, what, that's what's going on. Um, so the, the data is in there. You would have to have some custom script that pulled it out. Um, so yeah, so we just implemented that as suppl supplemental information. It's not very standardized. SPDX3 has an entire section devoted to vulnerability, which, as you can see, is quite complicated. Um, so they had some people who were really into CVEs and security tracking all this stuff, um, and it's actually completely VEX compliant. It, does anyone know what VEX is? VEX, no? Okay, so VEX is um, a... It's kind of an abstract sta standard for describing how you have addressed a vulnerability. It's a document, basically, that says, like, if you're VEX compliant, you need to have these things that describe how you've dealt with a vulnerability. So it's, yeah, I don't know. You can look up the document. I should have put a link to it. It's a pretty dry read, but it's short. Um, so SPDX3 will do this. So what they have now is you can uh, have your package and you can say that it has an associated vulnerability which just says like, hey, we know this CVE you know, applies to this package. It doesn't say what you've done with it, it just says that it exists, right? So you can track, pretty easily track like what CVEs we know about and what CVEs we don't know about. Um, and then you can make these VEX uh, VEX relationships that describe how you address the vulnerability and why. So there's a, a relationship that's like does not affect and then you can say why, why it doesn't affect it. Um, so I actually just got this working like last week where um, it'll look through our uh, CVE check uh, variables and populate these more or less correctly. Um, so that's really useful. So you can say like doesn't affect or you know, whatever, like if for whatever reason we had ones that we did know affect it, you can put that in there too. It's like we didn't pass this. It's not that it doesn't need it, it's just we didn't do it. Um, so that's really helpful for from that perspective. All right, so where are we at today? Um, so this is the uh, SPDX3 kind of uh, visual model that we are working with today. Um, it kind of, uh, it, it's in a different format, but it's actually quite similar to what we had with the SPDX2. Um, we just moved it to uh, draw.io to make it a little easier to manage. So, you know, again, you've got your recipe, but this is a build this time, and it's generating, you know, it has, has outputs of these packages that get produced. You see all the properties that we're putting on there, the licenses and things like that. And this is out of date. I, I added this, the CVE stuff in uh, since then. You can uh, look at it with the link should work just fine. And you can see we're pulling the source files and doing all the stuff we did with SPDX2 with license scanning. Um, and we can track the sysroot files and the source URI things. Um, and then the new stuff is kind of down here. You can see this, this is that top level bit bake build I was talking about, right? So that's an ancestor of each of the recipe builds. Um, and then, you know, you can link that to a build host. You can add the invoked by and delegation information and things like that. Um, and basically anything that's green, uh, uh, anything that's green is stuff that we have working today. Anything that's not green is stuff 
that we're thinking about adding, stuff we would like to add maybe. Um, so for example, I think it'd be really cool to have the rootfs actually link back to the files from the packages, especially by checksum, because then you could say, oh, this, this file on the rootfs was changed by you know, debug tweaks. <laughs> Someone zapped the root password, right? <laughs> um, so you could actually see that in the SBOM. It's like, oh, this, this, the, the checksum of this changed. It must have been done somewhere between the thing getting packaged and installed on the root FS, right? Um, so yeah, so you can take a look at that if you're, if you're interested. Uh, that's uh, kind of where we're at with that today. Um, some of the things uh, that we've been talking about doing, um, so right now there's just a single, it's not a single task, but there's a collection of tasks that are like do create SPDX, and then there's like do create <coughs> SPDX uh, image, or there's a couple, there's a family of tasks called do that. Um, but potentially in the future it might make more sense if basically any task can just produce SPDX documents. Um, and basically, that what, what that would allow us to do is more fine-grained tracking of like how files progress through the system and get manipulated. Huh? Yeah. Yep. So you could say like, oh, like these are the source files that got downloaded in do fetch, and then they got compiled and generated these object files, and then you know something random came in here and setted something at a later step. You know, so you can really track, really track those files through the entire build process um, by doing that. Um, there's a few technical problems with doing this, um, but I, I think we can probably figure out a way to solve those eventually. Um, or maybe just limit it to S state tasks, I'm not sure. Um, that's one of the problems is like how do you store it. Um, yeah, so that would re require that. Um, yeah, and that's basically impossible. We would have never been able to do that with SPX2 because of the way documents are linked. Uh, so uh, most of the work for this is done. <laughs> um, it's on a branch, and uh, we're we're waiting for SPX3 to be finalized before we like make this real. Because what's their deadline? What's their deadline? Uh, yeah, basically, yeah, like, yeah. Um, they're, they're working on it really hard um, because they, they want, really, really want to get it done. Um, I personally, like, I want them to get a good spec, so, but I think they're looking for, like, like less than months time frame. So, yeah, they, they're, they're, they're really, really, really pushing it, so. Um, um, are there already tools who can uh, ingest SPDX3 and do something useful with it? Um, <laughs> that's a good question that I don't know the answer to. I haven't uh, seen any. Rsync? What? Rsync? Rsync? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Um, there, I've seen some demos for some things. Um, I don't personally have any experience with tools that ingest it. Um, I've mostly just been like each validating it with a shackle model, right? It's like, oh, someone could parse this, but I haven't used it myself. Do, do you know of any Marta that can I, do I attended things? some talks in the. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I attended some talks in the SBOM room at FOSDEM yesterday, and several people were talking about how their tools could work with SPDX3. Okay. So soon there will be more, even if today you can't download one. Yeah, I, I, I think I think like because of the way SPDX3 works, it should hopefully be much easier and we'll see a lot more tools. Right. I, I'm just a little bit curious about how the CVE reporting is working with the SBOM. Say I have something that I've built a system last year and now I have an SBOM. Can I just take that SBOM and then throw it in the grinder and have all the CVEs fall out? Or is that with, with SPDX3? Yeah. Yes, that's the idea, right? So, so it's detached. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it should be. So what, what basically what, what you'll have, so, so these, are the, um, these are the two relationships that you end up using. Well, this, this one's actually a bunch of different ones. Like each way you dealt with a CVE is uh, right, a different relationship. That, that, that belongs in your SBOM, I think. Because that's in that's, the SBOM. That's what you did. Yeah. But I, I find that, well, anyway. 
you, you want to periodically in the future yes. check, check that against MITRE and find your... Yes. Yeah. So presumably there would be a tool, which is probably not a very complicated tool, right, that goes through and says like, oh cool, you got all these packages with CPEs, right? Like, what are all the CVEs for it? These are the ones that the SBOM already knew about. These are the ones the SBOM didn't know about. And these are the ones that are already dealt with. So that's the idea. Yeah. Like this is now that we're just talking about it, like for example, dependency track. I'm not sure if it supports SPDX, but it supports Cyclone DX. Yeah. And I wanted to ask like how does Cyclone DX compare in terms of I don't to know. SPDX? Okay. I, I don't know. Um, I'm not the person to ask for that. Um, okay. We've basically chose SPDX from the beginning and uh, there's tools to convert between them, so that's kind of been our. We don't really have. Uh, we don't really have a lot of capacity to support multiple SBOM formats, so we kind of are just going to stick with SPDX and okay. yeah, because like, you can convert. So, and that is like I will say on the SPDX three, like the ability to convert between different uh, SPDX formats is like a first class thing that they want to make sure works. So, um, you know, they, they want, it is designed from the beginning so that you can convert from SPDX or from Cyclone DX to SPDX. Sometimes that uh, adds a little overhead on the spec, if you will, <laughs> but uh, um, that, that's something that they want to work. So that's kind of been ours, just like, we'll just let that work. And, um, while we're on the topic of overhead on the spec, um, I wonder what's what's the reason for the, all the complexity here. So for me, the, the like unspoken use case was always okay. Like given this pile of binaries, um, what are the outdated, vulnerable versions of OpenSSL in this UFI firmware, right? And once I've like answered this question and have somebody like change some of the lines in the source code before they compile it, right? Right. And if we're there, then the hard part is not really uh, like taking care of the source code, but okay, what's the workaround? How do I pressure AMI to like ship a patch? Um, right. I don't really care about what the guy that built that typed in his computer to do it. Yeah. So I mean, the the vulnerability tracking, like the the precise vulnerability tracking like this, this is new to SPDX3, right? So you weren't able to do this before in a standardized way, right? So kind of the whole point of SBOMs in general is that there's a standardized way for people to talk about software and what's in software. You know, that, that you, you, like you can give this to someone else and they can make sense of it, right? Without having to like, it, you know, it's not a spreadsheet of CVs, right? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like you can parse this with a machine. You can have tools that do automated things with this. So that's kind of the entire point of that. Um, the vulnerability tracking um, of CVE specifically is one use case of SBOMs, and it's probably the most publicized use of SBOMs. It's not definitely not the only use, right? And so, if you're going to make a tool that can describe all of these things, they they would just want to have one SBOM that can be used for all these different use cases. Um, Besides that, because like one of the things that they're talking about also is like so naming software components uh, is uh, really hard. So like when you're talking about like oh, like you said like I want to find Open SSL and uh, uh, you know know if I need to apply patches to it, right? And so like that has a CPE, but like different distros might call it a different thing, right? And so like that naming is really hard. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Sorry. So one of the things that they're talking about doing is like, well, maybe we can say like, if you have this source file with this checksum in your build, then you know you're vulnerable because you didn't patch it. It's got this checksum, right? So that's one of the things that you would be able to do with this type of thing. Marta, what do you mean? Uh, yeah. Um SPDX3 is quite modular. You haven't said that, Joshua. Uh, oh, yeah. And it, it has multiple profiles. Yeah. So you can customize the generation, uh, customize the parts of the standards that you are generating and that we are not generating. So uh, the big work, I think, and the big discussion that we will need to have is on 
which options do you add so that you can customize? Because if you generate everything, just generating the source path of the Linux kernel, um, you are just wondering if it got stuck somewhere because it's <laughs> for minutes, it's just generating a generative phase for minutes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's not practical to use at every run, and the actual options and the actual profiles that will be generated or not, depending on the options that you choose, that will be an important thing to, uh, to seriously discuss. Yeah. Um, so just my closing thought real quick is like, uh, the SPDX is like, we were basically at the limit of what we could do with SPDX2. Um, we were kind of pushing the bounds in a lot of cases on what it could do. Um, and a lot of those things have been addressed with SPDX3. It's going to be much better. Um, so it has a much higher ceiling of what we should be able to do. And yeah, the profiles will be cool. We'll need to have that discussion also because that can control how big your documents are versus how useful they are, right? Uh, I've given a lot of talks on this, so you can look at those if you're interested. <laughs>